So we're going to get into prayer, okay? Uh, when I say the word prayer, how many of you get excited when I say prayer? All right. Who wants to come up here? No, and pray. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, prayer is like one of those things that everyone knows we're supposed to do, but it's like eating broccoli. You know, I know I'm supposed to eat broccoli. It's pretty good with cheese on it and the baked potato. But I, I just, I know I'm supposed to pray, but, you know, it's, it's just a tough thing to do, right? We know we're supposed to pray, and we have different views of prayer. And a lot of folks are like, what's the use of even praying? Anyhow, God is going to do what God is going to do. And then we have other people that try to get God to hold them hijack, to go on a hunger strike. You know, if I pray long enough and do long enough, then God will do what I want to do. What, what is prayer? Does it even make a difference anyhow? And so we're going to look at it today because it's one of the most important things that you and I can do. As believers in Jesus Christ, prayer is one of the most important things that we can do. Nothing in history that we can see has ever happened before prayer. God's will released upon this earth throughout human history, it all began with prayer. Creation began with prayer. God said to himself, let us, right? Everything is communion. In what is prayer, by the way? What is prayer? You can speak out loud. Talking to God, okay. What else is prayer? Anything else? All right. Well, prayer is, it, indeed, it is communication with God. A lot of people see it as a monologue. You know what a monologue is, right? When you're just talking to God, right? Just saying, God, I want this, I want that, I want the other. And uh, it's almost like this. Some people treat God, uh, prayer is a relationship. So it's like me talking to Kevin in the back there, and so on, Kevin, it is so good to see you, Kevin, with your blue shirt. Kevin, I'm so glad you're here today, Kevin. Kevin, I'm so glad you're my friend, Kevin. Kevin, I thank you, Kevin. Goodbye. <laughs> right? Well, I did it four or five times, so surely Kevin's going to know I like him. He's a good guy. Right? That's not how you have a relationship with somebody. You don't go home and say, oh, my dearest wife, thou art beautiful. Oh, my dearest wife, thou art beautiful. Fruit of your womb is our children. The fruit of the womb is our children. Blessed be your dinner. Blessed be your dinner. Blessed be your dinner. May it not be burnt. May it not be burnt. I love you. I love you. Okay, please take the kids to Little League and make sure my shirts are ironed and pick them up at the cleaners. I'm going. See you later. Bye. Now, is that a relationship? By the way, if that happened, I would not be here right and I'd be in the hospital. <laughs> okay. So we treat God as if he's some kind of formula. we got to crack the code. i got to say enough Hail Marys or enough Our Fathers or enough uh, Lord's Prayers. And listen, I'm not against people doing those different things, but you have to understand something, that we are in a relationship with God. We were created for relationship. The world was created by relationship. God created us in relationship, and we, our relationship is prayer. Okay, It's communication. It's not a monologue. And a lot of people have these different ideas that if I blab it, I can grab it. If I can confess it, I can possess it. A lot of people think if I pray hard enough, God will do what I want him to do. And, and that's not really true. And then there's other people that say it doesn't make a difference if you pray or not. God is going to do what God's going to do, and that's all he's going to do. So a, a, lot, a lot of people don't believe in prayer. There's a lot of misconceptions about prayer. Okay? And like what Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. By the way, if you want something good to read, Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, one of the best devotionals I've ever read. He writes in a very, very uh, prolific English way what he says in one paragraph most authors cannot say in a whole book. Great stuff. And he always comes back to this. And everything that pretty much happened Jesus did not begin his ministry until he prayed. When he chose his 12 disciples, he went up in the mountain and he prayed. Before he went to the cross, he prayed. Everything he did in prayer, he says, I do nothing unless I see the Father doing it, which means a communication process. He's, who's, he whose mind is set upon thee is in perfect peace. So God wants us to have this relationship with him in prayer. If prayer is so important... Why do we struggle with prayer? Many have a misconceptions about prayer. Why don't people believe in the power of prayer? Well, misconceptions about prayer. A lot of think, people think it's existentialism. What will be is what will be. I'm not going to get into all the theological camps out there, but it seems like 
It seems like if someone believes in the sovereignty of God, they go extreme. If someone believes that God is it's all up to us, they go to the extreme. And so it seems like both sides extreme. Now, we don't see this happening in our country right now, do we? Extremes. Now, we don't have extremes. We're very balanced people. But there are people that think they can control God, and people think we have no choice in the matter. God's going to do what God's going to do, so why pray? I guess we pray because it helps change us a little bit, but it's not going to change God. And so people think that God is sovereign and a fatalistic view, all right? And so that's not the case at all. Prayer does not change God, but it changes the one who prays. How many think that's true? How many, let me show of hands. How many think that's absolutely 100% true? Okay. How many think you're being tricked? <laughs> okay, thank you. This is true, and yet it's not exactly true. Prayer does not change God. That's true, but it does change the one who prays. I pray it is the case. The Bible says if we ask anything according to his will, he does it. So our, we have to be according to his will, right? And God will give us the desires of our heart. Our heart changes to him. So, yes, prayer does not change God. But do you realize it changes the, the hand of God? Do you realize if we don't pray, things don't get done often? We're going to explain why. And how you and I can pray. We're going to go to a series of 10 days of prayer starting uh, the next Monday. Not this one, the next Monday. And we're going, to, um, we're going to commemorate the whole thing and end it with a uh, night of worship. Uh, I think as I have to look up the dates. I don't have it in front of me right now. I'll have it later on for you. Because we believe it's important to pray. Nothing happens without prayer. It's so important. You know, for example, I've used this example before, but it's so important to understand it. I hope you understand that we're different jurisdictions that we have. You've heard of the armed forces, of course, right? There's the four branches, or now five branches. Now we got Space Force. So anyhow, we're not going to get into that right now. But the issue is this. We have the Air Force. I like to call our prayer ministry Prayer Force. In fact, we might start calling it that, Prayer Force. We need the Prayer Force to win the battle in the natural. We do. You see, what happens in a wartime, I've used it before, but I'll use it again. They have to have a military air campaign first before you send the ground troops. you got a carpet bomb. you got to knock out the strategic places. You need good intelligence. You, you, right? you send the airplanes in, smart bombs. You soften the target. Then the ground troops go in. Now, the dr ground troops cannot fly the airplanes, but they can talk to the commander who will send the planes out for them. Hey, listen, the enemy's over here. I need you to knock them out. I'll give you the, I'll give you the core. I'm going to paint it with a target. You get a laser, you paint the, the place, and all of a sudden a Apache comes by or something like that, and they shoot a missile out, and they blow it, hellfire, whatever it is, and it blows it up, and you can go in. This is what happens strategically. So you need that. In many ways, prayer's that way. Prayer pays the way for God to move. So God wants us to work with him in prayer. And, and listen, everybody, if prayer is so important, if nothing happened in the, in the history of mankind without prayer, and prayer is absolutely necessary for the kingdom of God to happen, if you're the enemy of God, what are you going to try to do if prayer is that important? You're going to try to discourage people from praying. You're going to try to get people not to pray. You're going to get people to fall asleep and think it's boring, right? If I call a prayer meeting, everyone says it's important. But you know, I call a prayer meeting, no one wants to come. Why? They're going to ask me to pray, first of all. I don't want to pray. And I kind of find it boring. You're looking at the sports. Huh? Pray. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Right? I've done it before, too. I mean, I, I've actually sat at the bed and prayed. Lord God, I pray you, you bless this food before. Oh, I'm going to sleep. You ever do that? Okay, you guys are more spiritual than I am. So that's what prayer, prayer can do. So prayer does not change God, but it changes the one who prays. No, prayer changes the hand of God. But we cannot manipulate God. We cannot, God, God is God, but we have a participation in it. And you're going to see in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about prayer. So a lot of people think the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? God is going to do what God's going to do, no matter what he's going to do. It makes no difference. Right? This is called the sovereignty of God. So people believe that. So let me explain what the sovereignty of God is. There's ownership. God owns everything. God owns everything. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We hear it in Scripture, right? So that's the sovereignty of God. He owns everything, okay? Authority. He has absolute authority over everything. And finally, he also, he controls everything. He's in total control. So, why, so what's the sense of praying? We pray to change us, not to, pray, not to change God. Is that why we pray? 
But you're going to see something in a few moments. It's more than that. You see, God in his sovereignty has given man a free will. Now, can I just ask you, some of you theologians out there, you're always getting into Calvinism and Arminianism, I don't care what Calvinism says, and I don't care what Arminianism says. I care what the Bible says. And what happens is we get crazy. We, man always does this. If I like iPhones, then Androids are evil. If you have Androids, iPhones are evil. If I like the Yankees, the Red Sox are evil. Actually, what's really evil now is the Baltimore Orioles, okay? But that's beside the point. So we like to pick and choose and demonize what's not like us. You see, God is in his sovereign will has given man a free will. And so it both can be true, which I'll explain another time. But God has given us free will. He gave man and women an opportunity in the garden to either obey him or not obey him. God says, if you will, then I will. We have a choice. We're not robots. God gives us choices. And so God is indeed in total control. I like what it says here in Proverbs 19.3. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. I told you not to marry that guy who's on a weekend furlough. I know you're impressed with his ankle bracelet. He's wanted in three counties and has a rap sheet, and he's not an artist. He literally has a rap sheet. And so you marry the guy anyhow, and then you're wondering why he's back in prison. Okay, you made a bad decision. Pastor Tom will counsel you after the service. He's in the back there, if that's you. No, seriously, we make these bad decisions. We buy things we can't afford, and we blame God. Right? God, you need to help me, God. I'm struggling with my diabetes. Well, get the haagen -Dazs out of your refrigerator and give it to me. Right? Chunky monkey is funky when you got diabetes. It doesn't help. Oh, I, I got to do better than this. I got to, my sugar levels are out. You're drinking, you're drinking Jolt Cola. Right? So listen, everybody, we got to help God out here. We make our own foolish decisions and we blame God. In fact, all the problems we're having today a lot of the cancers we have and the diseases we have is because mankind decides to screw up the food chain, right? We put chemicals in there. I'm not gonna, it's not political. I'm just saying. You know, all these things begin to happen. There's toxins in the air. So what happens? Sin has caused that. It's not God's fault. It's what we blame God. We make our own decisions, and then we blame God. So I've made a lot of bonehead decisions in my life. One of the greatest decisions I've ever made next to Jesus Christ is marrying Sandra. I don't know why she married me. She's probably the bonehead. But anyhow, I <laughs> people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at the Lord. So how does this all work? God has given man a free will. And so we're going to look at Scripture in a few moments about Genesis, and let's go ahead and do that right now, is the Bible, we're going to go back to the beginning, all right? God set up the whole thing, set up all creation, he set up mankind, he set the rules, he set the playing field, and then we are supposed to work within what he's called us to do. Now, by the way, God's all about relationships, by the way, all about relationships. So let's go ahead and read from the very beginning of, of the Bible, Genesis, which means the beginnings, because so God created what? Man in his own image. It doesn't mean that he looks like me. It means that the character riches of God, he's created mankind in his own image. Now listen to this. This is very important. And uh, I, maybe YouTube might kick me off for reading this verse. But, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him what? Male and female. Okay, that's what the Bible says. He created them XX and XY. That's male and female. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So God is calling us to be fruitful and to multiply and subdue the earth. Now, please understand something. What does God tell us to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Is your, if you're a single person, it doesn't mean you're not doing the will of God. No, but generally speaking, God wants to be fruitful, means do good things, and multiply. And what? And subdue and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
over every living thing, even cats, <laughs> and over everything that moves along the earth. Now, let me tell you about cats for a second, not the play. <laughs> let me give you an example about the sovereignty of God. You guys ready for a good example about the sovereignty of God? Okay. We had a Siamese cat when I was growing up. The Siamese cat name was Susie. What a stupid name, but that's what my parents called. <laughs> and this was the meanest cat you ever had in your life. I would pull its tail. I was terrible. But Susie was a very intelligent cat. She, she was very intelligent, and she knew not to jump on the kitchen counters. She knew that she did that. She'd get a spray bottle of hydrochloric acid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Susie, she knew that. And, and she, she'd go like this. She'd go, and she'd look at us, right? So, now, this is what happens. If I were to put a camera there, which we didn't have back in those days, I know that she's going to jump on that counter. Why? Because I know her character. Right? That's why we got rid of her. <laughs> we, 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 I know what she's going to do. She's going to do whatever she wants to do. You, you know the old saying, everybody. Dogs have owners. Cats have staff. <laughs> so, that's in the Bible, by the way. Bucci 818. So what happens is I know that this cat is going to jump on the counter. I just know it. So you have a camera there. So you leave the house, the cat jumps on the counter. Now, did I make the cat jump on the counter? No, but I knew it was going to do it because I know the character of the counter. Okay, we make our own choices. God may know what we're going to do, but we still make our choices. There you have sovereignty and free will. No, say thank you. Don't say meow. Okay. And subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God has given us dominion, and that he's given, he's delegated responsibility to us. Remember, everybody, man, help God with a creative process. We were perfect. He brought animals to us. Again, we named them, which shows we were in partnership with God. In fact, do you realize God did not make that chair you're sitting on? But he made the principles and the properties and he made mankind who figured out how to build a chair. So ultimately, God did, is responsible, but mankind built it based on the properties they've learned through thousands of years, right? So what happens is God gives it, but we still work in it. So God has given us dominion over the earth, and this is what happened, okay? He said subdue, which means to master and control. So God told us to master and control. Now, prayer is how God implements his will in a world without violating his free will. God uses prayer to have his will take place without violating our free will. Because often he won't act until we act. And if we think that prayer is only about changing us, in fact, the Bible says that we can help hasten the day of the coming of the Lord if we do our job. We get the gospel to all the nations. We can hasten the day. I mean, the Bible talks about that. You can hasten the day. You can't control the day. Well, how does this all work? Okay, let me give you an example. If, uh, if I send you on a cruise ship to go to, to go to, let's say, go to the Bahamas, once you're on that ship, you're on that ship. Now, you have freedom upon that ship to a certain degree, right? You can choose to go to the buffet you can choose not to go to a buffet. You can go to a tofu bar if you want to, or you can go to the real place where they have meat. Okay? So you can choose where you want to go. You want to go to the pool. You want to go to whatever you want to do. You want to go to the deck. You want to go on a water slide, whatever. So you have a certain amount. There's a sovereignty of the ship. The ship is going to the Bahamas, but you're on that ship. Now, can you jump off that ship if you want to? Yeah, you sure can. But you're on that ship, and you make your choices on that ship. Okay, God has his sovereign will, and then he has his permissive will. He has a flex will. And that way, we have flexibility to do certain things. God's delegated things to us, and he often won't act until we act. So he has us to subdue our control. Let me explain a little bit here. This, this is God. This is man, okay? He, ownership of all. He gets stewardship. That is a, that's in tongues. Stewardship of God's possession. Okay, ownership of all, stewardship of God's possessions. God has absolute authority. We have delegated authority. All right? Complete control over all things, limited control on the earth. 
And you learn that when you have kids. All right? That's, that's how it works. So God has legally instructs us how we're supposed to live. You see how this works? He's delegated things to us. How many of you enjoyed when we had our dear friend a couple weeks ago from Indonesia? Don Butera. The wild man, right? I love him. One time, I never forget this. He came back. We were talking. We were, out eat, we were eating out. He's, he's at a restaurant. He's, he gets angry. He gets kind of upset. Can you believe it? I go, what? Can you believe that Jesus is showing up at mosque and giving visions to Muslims while they're in the mosque? I'm like, that's fantastic. No, it's not. That's our job. I'm like, what? Yeah, we're not doing our job, so he has to go do it himself. <laughs> and he was really upset about that. God often does that. You see it throughout the Bible. You see it in the New Testament. One time there was a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile who believed in God. And, and so an angel came to him and says, I want you to go to Peter. He's staying at the place called Simon the Tanner's house, who was a leather guy, not a guy that likes to tan. So you're trying to find a proof text to go tanning. It's not good for you. Anyhow, so, so anyhow, they sent him over there, right? And, then, and why didn't the angel just speak to him alone? Because God delegated authority to man. And he wants us to do it. The apostle Paul got blinded. Jesus spoke to him. I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. I want you to go to the, the street called Straight. And there you're going to hear what's going to happen. He sends Ananias to lay hands. Why? Because God delegates responsibility to us. Everything is not going to happen automatically. Okay? I like, I like with this, this scripture, not scripture, this is a good book, and it's written a number at Why Pray. It says this, when, implement, when implemented properly, just track with me, prayer permits God to exercise his sovereignty in a world under the dominion of a rebel with free will in a universe governed by natural law. There are those among the rebels who have chosen of their own free will to obey God. They want his will to be done more than their own. So they pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. As they pray that prayer, they set up the conditions under which God can legally impose his will in a given situation. I think it does a really good job of explaining what it is. God has voluntarily given us responsibility, and he will not do it unless we do it. Right? If you have children, and if you keep on doing everything for them, they'll never grow up. So God gives us responsibility to do various things. So, for example, let me show you how that works. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. This is what Jesus says. I want you to see God's heart here, by the way. Look at his heart here. Jesus' is heart. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful. He's talking about people who don't know Jesus. He had compassion. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Why does he have to ask for that for? Well, won't Jesus just do it without us praying? No. Okay? Prayer is how God implements his will in the world without violating our free will. It's one of the ways. Okay? That's how it works in many ways. That's how he does it. He will not violate our free will. He gives us free will to receive or reject, to draw close or not draw close to God. And so, listen, what, everything that's happening right now in our world, a lot of it is controlled by prayer. Now, please understand, I know I just talked to a, a person yesterday who had a situation with their family members. They prayed, they did everything in their power, and they still had a very sick child. And the child's doing better now. But they tried everything under the heaven. They knew what to do. And this person still died later on. So these things can happen. Why? And it gets frustrating. I pray for somebody, they die of cancer. I pray for another person, they die. I pray to have a job, I lose my job. After a while, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to pray anymore. It's too painful. I believe God's a good God, yet he's not acting good according to what I understand. And then you have people that say, well, if it be thy will. And then I've heard this. Oh, a little kid was playing ball in the street and got hit. Oh, God must have won another angel in heaven. It's God's will. No, it's not God's will for that child to die in the street. Then why do you allow it? Because we live in a sinful world. Someone chose to speed in their car, right? That's why. 
Now, could we have prayed and stopped it? I don't know. There are mysteries. Right now, we're going through the book of Job in the Bible reading plan of the year, which is phenomenal, by the way. And you can see, sometimes it's a mystery, but God still tells us to pray, and we'll get more into it in a few moments. Prayer is how God implements his will in a world without violating our free will. God will normally not legally implement his will until we ask him to. He says, pray, pray. Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Pray. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our families instead of getting angry, instead of getting vindictive and kind of thinking you're higher than somebody else. We need to pray how God legally implements his will. I'll show you real quickly. In Matthew 9, 36, we said that we did that already. This is called deja vu all over again. Okay, in 2 Peter, check this out. The Lord is not slow about his promises as some, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, wishing for anyone to, not wishing anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. God wants the whole world to be saved, right? All that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how can they call upon the name of the Lord unless someone is sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So we are to pray for the harvest. We are to pray for God to move. We are to pray these various things. He doesn't wish for any to perish. That's why we spread the gospel. Lord Jesus, would you save, our, would, you pray, would you pray for your family members? I have a friend of mine, his my name is Dick Lappert. He, for 17 years, his wife Joanne prayed for him to come to the Lord. Finally, after 17 years, he came to the Lord. And she said, I stopped nagging him and I started praying. Nagging doesn't work very well. In fact, nagging is counterproductive. And then she kept on praying and praying, and then God said, now's the day to tell him straight. He needs to get his life together, and he did. God listens to our prayers. He's wishing none to perish. So we should pray, Father, would you bring salvation to my family members? Lord, would you bring salvation to Washington, D.C.? Father, will you touch our elected leaders? Father, will you touch us? We begin to pray. It's powerful to pray, everybody. We're asking, we're praying God's will to be accomplished. I like what Watchman Nee said. This is an amazing quote. Here it is. Our prayers lay the track down which God's power can come. Like a mighty locomotive, his power is irresistible, but it cannot reach us without the rails. We pray, we lay the rails down. Your kingdom come. When we pray for his kingdom to come, then the locomotion of his will will be done. You see, you and I need to be praying. We need to be praying. Continue to pray. Do not give up on prayer. We're going to talk more about that next time, how our prayers can be powerful. And I, I listen, everybody, the enemy wants to tell us that we can't pray. The enemy wants to fool us that our prayers don't matter. The enemy wants us to remember when God didn't answer our prayers, so what's the use? I had a friend tell me a number of years ago, he said this to me. He was a cessationist, didn't believe in the supernatural work of the Lord, and he thought everything's going to happen the way it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do. He says, the problem with you people that believe God has a, you know, gives you sovereignty, God gives you free will, and God can heal today, is that you expect too much from God, and you get disappointed. I don't expect much, and I'm not disappointed. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. That's exactly what it is. Because we want to control God. When I put the light switch on, I want him to light up immediately. But sometimes I have to let God be God. I got to pray. I got to ask God. I have to seek his will. I have to go after him without, right? And God will often reveal his will. We're not going to be able to, to cover all that today. You see, the Bible says in James 5, 16, this is important. Therefore, confess your sins to what? One another. It's kind of hard to confess your sins to one another when you have no, no other. In recent days, Pastor Rennie talked about it. In recent days, I, we've seen a lot of people fall from the faith and mess up. And the only way we can be sure, our, we need relationships. We need to voluntarily submit to accountability. All of us need it. And that can only happen in relationships. Christ has called us to be in relationships. He sent his disciples out two by two. He never sent them out all by themselves. That's only the Lone Ranger. But the Lone Ranger still had Tonto. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch Nick at Night. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and what? Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person, a righteous man and woman, has great power 
as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed, what? If it be thy will, Lord, bring the rain. No, he prayed fervently. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain. Then he prayed again, and he kept asking him, go back and see, go back and see. And he kept on praying, kept on praying. He was birthing in prayer. He was praying through. Today, we, if God doesn't answer right away, we're done. Sometimes God wants us to work it through prayer because it's a battle. We can see from Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel prayed, there was a, there was a war going on in the heavenlies, and we need to tell God, we need to continue to pray to God for his will to take place. We can't control God, but we can actually have an effect how God works in our lives. And he tells us to pray on reason. Then he prayed again, and the heavens rained. If my people, I know, I know, no matter who I say, the whole thing's a mess. Can we agree with that at least? (laughs) You know what I'm going to talk about, don't you? Yeah. The whole thing is a mess. Our country is a mess. Our political system is a mess. The best mess in the world, might I add. Thank God for the mess we have. But how are we supposed to change the mess? We change the mess first by prayer. Daniel said, we have forgotten your prophets. And Daniel's counting himself in, right? So what do we do? If who? Not those people. You see the condition here? If what? My people who are called by my name will what? Humble. Oh, my gosh. What's that mean? I thought that's a hot dog. No. (laughs) Humble themselves. And pray. So we had to humble ourselves and pray. And what? Seek my face. Not my gifts, but seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Guys, you got some wicked ways. I got some wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So really, it's really not the job of the politicians. Oh, we need to vote correctly. We need to run for government. I understand all that. But you and I need to humble ourselves. You understand pride comes before the fall. And one thing we see in the political realm is a lot of pride. I see a lot of pride online, dropping things to each other and saying things to each other. I'm not going to mention any names. The social media is a bad place to have discussions because you can be bold behind your thumbs. Right? So what do we do? we got to humble ourselves and pray and seek my face. The Bible says in, in 1 Timothy 2, 1, first of all, I, I ask you to pray and have supplications for all of those in authority, for kings, that it might go well with you. We need to pray for our country, not curse our country. Lord Jesus, amen? And we start with ourselves. The, you can't change your spouse. You can't change your kids. You can't change your boss. All you can do is change you, barely. And one of the ways is by humbling yourselves, praying and seeking my face, turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. The answer to our dilemmas first starts by prayer. It builds the track for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. And we need to pray his kingdom, not the kingdom of those about and around us. You see, we have the opportunity to shape history with our relationship with God through prayer. This is how we do it. And I want to encourage you. It's wrong thinking that has caused many people not to pray. They think it doesn't matter. God's going to do what he's not going to God's going to do what he's going to do anyhow. No. I hopefully you saw today just a little bit. I have a lot more examples how if you don't pray, God often won't act. And I will say to you that almost every single thing, I'll reiterate, everything in history that we've seen happen in the kingdom of heaven has first come by prayer. Jesus came by prayer. What happened with the Israelites who were in captivity? God heard their what? Their cry. Yet he prophesied they would be in slavery. Yes, but he heard their cry. Remember, there's God's sovereign will and there's free will. You're on that cruise ship. You can jump off that cruise ship if you want to. But you're on that cruise ship. His sovereign will is going a certain direction, but you have a certain amount of freedom. And prayer is one of the major ways, and Jesus has shown us how important prayer is. You see, if you want to grow up, we have to both read the Bible and pray and have fellowship. If you want to dry up, just read the Bible. If you want to blow up, just pray. But if you want to grow up, read the Bible and pray. 
God wants us to be a praying church. So I want to encourage you to mark your calendars and, and take an opportunity to do that. You see, the Bible says this, without what? Faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God, how do you come to God? Through prayer. Must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. To experience God's power, we must become people of prayer. We don't control God. We must pray according to his will. But my friends, the earth is in the balance. Your family is in the balance. This church is in the balance. It's based upon how we pray and how we act. It's not one or the other. It's in that order. But we can do no more than pray until after we prayed. I want to encourage you that today. We have something called 10 Days of Prayer coming up, September 8th to the 18th. We're going to pray every day. We're going to encourage you to take time. Take extra time to pray. On the 18th, we're going to have a, a time of, of prayer and worship. We're going to have a worship night here. We're going to pray for our country. We're going to pray for our church. We're going to pray that God's kingdom will come and his will be done on earth as it is in prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Father, I just thank you so much that you have not left us as orphans, but you sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. You've given us your word called the Bible. We thank you for the supernatural way it was put together. We want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us, never contradicting your word. We want to thank you that clarity comes with the body of Christ working together. Lord, I ask that you would put such a passion in our hearts to go after you in prayer. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would plant in our hearts a hunger and a thirst to spend time with you in prayer. Father, I ask that you would begin to help our church more than ever to become a strong force of prayer. Father, you're calling us to pray for our families. You're calling us to pray for our church. You're calling us to pray for our communities. You're calling us to pray for our state. You're calling us to pray for our country. You're calling us to pray for the elections. You're calling us to pray for Israel and the rest of the world. Lord, we want to be about your kingdom. Lord, we recognize that you've given us authority. And Lord, we pray that we'd be a people of prayer, that we'd see heaven come to earth, that your kingdom would come, and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we don't want to give up on prayer. As you said, Jesus, we're to keep on knocking, keep on asking, keep on asking and not give up. Father, I'm asking for you to move powerfully in our church. And Father, we would give you all the credit in Jesus' name.